Russia and NATO seem just one accident away from full-blown war, but if it went down, what would it look like and who would come out on top? Day 1 In the opening day of hostilities, NATO warplanes are immediately put into effect. Planning for every contingency, including an outbreak of hostilities over the Ukraine war, has been accomplished ahead of time, and the response is as automatic as a reflex. Nations all over Europe immediately mobilize their militaries and call up their reserves, while the United States calls up its own reserves and National Guards. A naval task force consisting of US and European vessels immediately heads for the Baltic Sea. Attack submarines and ASW vessels head for picket positions across the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap. Their job will be to stop any attempts by the Russian Navy to break out into the Atlantic, where it could potentially threaten US transports, bringing over the bulk of America's firepower to Europe. Of special concern are Russia's submarines, which must not be allowed to break out into the Atlantic at any cost. A furious hunt for any Russian subs unaccounted for begins across the Atlantic and North Pacific. In Kaliningrad, both Russia and NATO exchange a furious flurry of ground-launched cruise and ballistic missiles at each other. NATO has the firepower advantage. Russian stocks have been severely depleted due to the war in Ukraine and the need to pull from special reserves held in case of exactly this scenario. Russia has robbed Peter to pay Paul, and now it's coming up short in long-range attack missiles meant to slow down NATO air operations by destroying runways and other critical infrastructure across Poland, eastern Germany, and the Czech Republic. These sites are well defended by modern air defense systems, though, and lacking the ability to saturate NATO defenses, Russia's strikes inflict only moderate damage, slowing but not stopping air operations. Of greater effectiveness is attacks into the Baltic NATO members, destroying ports and other coastal infrastructure. Russia is attempting to prevent NATO forces from landing in the Baltics and threatening it directly. A massive air attack escorted by MiGs devastates multiple security fortifications across Russia's land border with the Baltic states. Follow-on strikes hit at each country's military command and control networks. NATO is always hard-pressed to defend the Baltics in case of a war with Russia, and because the surprise attack left little time to deploy aircraft to defend the skies of the Baltic states, the Russian attack is largely successful. Russian troops stationed along the border immediately roll into Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia in three separate thrusts toward each nation's capital. They only have a few days to secure the Baltics before NATO firepower beats it back. There's a quiet but tense peace in the north, as NATO's newest member is poised to join the fighting. Not wanting to open up an even bigger front for the already overextended Russian army, Putin tells his troops to dig in near the Finnish border. He knows it would be impossible to win a war against NATO if he opened up another front line. Leaving a token defense force while focusing the rest of the army's efforts in the south is the best option for the crazy dictator. For now, neither side dares to cross the border, so a sort of truce remains in effect. Sweden, however, has the luxury of time and distance. A NATO aspirant, Sweden knows exactly which way the wind is blowing in this war and throws its support behind NATO. Its navy begins a hunt for Russian subs, knowing that Russian air power is tied up in the assault on the Baltic states and largely unable to threaten it. Week 2 NATO has every advantage against Russia, but many of its European members experience readiness issues. An air campaign against Russian air defense networks, radar installations, command and control nodes, and other vital security infrastructure has been slow to manifest. But once it does, Russia is immediately put into the defensive. Wild weasel combat aircraft fly into the teeth of Russian air defenses. Specially modified and equipped with special purpose weapons, these daring pilots are trained to destroy enemy radars and air defense batteries. These must be suppressed before the bulk of NATO air power can do its job. Russia, though, has an extremely dense air defense network, and the job will take time. This means that in the Baltics, Russia currently has the advantage as its troops push ever closer toward the Baltic capitals. However, daring raids from multiple NATO carriers in the Baltics and the activation of NATO's Rapid Response Force have slowed the Russian assault to a crawl. NATO forces only number the thousands versus Russia's tens of thousands, but many of these Russian troops are either conscripts or on rotation out of Ukraine. Though combat veterans, they still suffer from war weariness, poor training, and bad doctrine. This is a force multiplier for NATO defenders, who are better trained and equipped and are supported by combat vehicles more capable than their Russian counterparts. But the Russian Baltic thrust has been slowed, not stopped, and realistically no NATO member has any great hope that the Baltics can truly be defended. It'll take weeks to assemble and transport large amounts of firepower into ports still under Russian attack. Week 3 Deep penetration strikes by the American B-2 bombers flying over the North Pole inflict catastrophic damage to Russian oil infrastructure in the Far East and the Urals. Submarine-launched cruise missiles add to the destruction of all important oil refineries, processing centers, and distribution networks. This sends a cold chill down the backs of Russian leadership, 
as these could just have easily been nuclear attacks. Despite dense air defense networks, only a single B-2 bomber is destroyed so far in the ongoing campaign. In the Pacific, the Russian fleet is bottled up in the Kamchatka Peninsula, under threat of destruction thanks to an American carrier strike group. With shore-based Granite anti-ship missile batteries, the fleet is kept safely out of range of American vessels. The Granite missile features a one-ton warhead, and though it might be old, it's still a capable and deadly threat to even America's big capital ships, the supercarriers. But Russia is unprepared for an air attack featuring America's newest anti-ship missile. The LRASM features a 1,000-pound warhead in a sleek body made of stealthy material. The missiles are launched from B-52s taking off from Japanese airfields at a range of over 230 miles and uses GPS and data links to guide themselves to their targets. However, on approach, the missiles go quiet and rely on their onboard artificial intelligence to plot an attack route, diving to just a few feet over the wave tops. Russian air defense radar detects them at a few dozen miles out, but they have less than 40 seconds to respond. Russian ships fire off volleys of interceptors as the LRASM's electronic brain scan the Russian ships and use image recognition software to identify each individual warship. Speaking to each other, the missiles assign their own targets as they scream in at 600 miles an hour. The volley of air defense missiles intercept multiple LRASMs, but many more punch through to hit their targets. The 1,000-pound warhead is on a delayed fuse, allowing it to penetrate into the hull of its target vessel before detonating to cause massive internal damage. Hundreds of sailors die. Six of the 11 major surface vessels of the Pacific Fleet are destroyed. Two more are seriously damaged. The Slava-class cruiser Vyag, flagship of the Pacific Fleet, has been targeted with great prejudice. In Europe, NATO forces are forced to pull out of the Baltics. With the Finnish front at a standstill, the Baltics were always undefendable. Kaliningrad stands in the way of NATO reinforcement, and the enclave is heavily militarized. NATO has long ago established air supremacy over Kaliningrad, but it was a difficult fight that cost the Alliance dozens of attack aircraft. A ground offensive will finally begin soon, though, as NATO European firepower is massing in eastern Germany and Poland. Forces from Britain, Spain, France, Germany, and Poland will be the vanguard of this attack. Turkey leads an air and naval effort to destroy the Russian Black Sea Fleet and attack Russian positions in Crimea. NATO's other members prepare themselves for a reinforcing push into Ukraine, where they'll link up with Ukraine's defenders and push east and south into Crimea itself. Despite Russia invading NATO territory directly, most of NATO's leadership agrees that a push into Russia itself is unacceptable, and it could be a provocation to use nuclear weapons. Week 4 NATO special forces unleash a campaign of sabotage inside Russia, bringing down railway bridges, destroying tracks, and setting ablaze important industrial and commercial targets. Taking a cue from Ukraine, NATO SOF wages a guerrilla campaign inside Russia itself, striking hard and fast, then melting back into the population. For its part, Russia has unleashed its own campaign of sabotage, but because of efforts in Ukraine, it's severely limited in scope. A plan to disrupt NATO operations with huge numbers of Spetsnaz agents all across Europe only results in small numbers of successful operations with minimal impact on NATO's ability to coordinate or move forces. Russian air defenses have been attrited considerably all across its western flank. With unchallenged air supremacy, Russian forces in Kaliningrad are routed and destroyed as the German-led offensive smashes Russian defenses. Using weapons such as smart cluster munitions, able to select their own targets and attack them from above, NATO aircraft bring a level of destruction to Russian forces not seen since Desert Storm. NATO air losses are significant, but blunted considerably by the widespread use of stealth aircraft such as the F-35, which lead the air campaign. With their ability to network with other friendly planes, F-35s are able to get deeper into Russian air defense networks and then direct weapons launched by non-stealthy planes to their targets. Russia's air force is swept out of the sky. The only real challenge to NATO is Russia's ground-based air defenses, which must be hunted down and eliminated one by one. With the sheer numbers of them, though, the task is a slow one, in turn slowing down the ground campaign. In both arenas, though, NATO looks to be superior in terms of doctrine, tactics, and equipment. Russia's only hope is to hold NATO in Belarus and the southern Baltics. Week 6 Russian forces are increasingly spread thin across Ukraine and the Baltics. Losses in combat against NATO forces are significantly higher than against Ukrainian forces. Russia rushes masses of conscripts to man large defensive works, supported by hordes of artillery, exactly the tactic used so successfully in Ukraine. But unlike in Ukraine, Russia now faces the most technologically capable air forces in the world. American Wild Weasel aircraft systematically hunt down and eliminate enemy air defenses, 
allowing for a lined ground attack aircraft to swoop down on Russian artillery positions while F-15s and Typhoons provide air cover. Russian troops, meanwhile, are being pummeled by precision artillery and special munitions launched from NATO bombers designed to destroy infantry in trenches. Every single attack is precise to within a few meters. Even in their trenches, Russian troops are not safe. Just minutes after each bombardment finishes, the rumbling of British challengers and European leopards is heard, descending on the defenders like an armored fist. Any Russian tank stupid enough to try to challenge NATO armor are instead met by attack helicopters or strafed by ground attack aircraft like the vaunted A-10. Any that survive are easily destroyed by European tanks with far greater range, precision, and sensors. This is the combined arms warfare that Russia attempted and failed at in Ukraine. Week 8 NATO's biggest limitation is manpower. Despite being roundly defeated militarily when its forces meet NATO forces, Russia has been better prepared for war than NATO and with more combat-ready ground forces. NATO has needed time to mobilize, some nations like Germany needed time to sort out bad logistics, and the US has had to transport its firepower over to Europe. By the end of the second month of fighting, though, Russia faces the growing might of the US Army and Marines, which relieve weary European forces across much of the front. Unlike NATO, Russia can't rotate its troops out of combat, and every two weeks they're forced into combat with NATO troops that have had time to rest and recuperate. Under the intense pressure of Western combined arms warfare, Russian morale is quickly breaking. Much like in Desert Storm, Russian troops find themselves under attack from all domains simultaneously. NATO electronic warfare operations disrupt their ability to communicate, as deep strikes into their rear eliminate command bunkers and vehicles foolish enough to transmit orders to the troops at the front. Meanwhile, precision air and artillery attacks make it impossible for armored vehicles to operate on the front, and infantry working in conjunction with armor and attack helicopters continuously probe at defenses and immediately exploit any weaknesses. By comparison with command networks disrupted or destroyed, Russian forces lack the personal initiative to make decisions on their own. Not that it would do much good if they did, as NATO's increasing air supremacy makes it perilous to mass forces for an attempt at an attack. Russia's only hope is to fight a continuous sequence of defensive battles, hoping to bleed NATO forces to the point that the squeamish Western public has had enough and gives up on the war. This is the one advantage Russia has over the West. Vladimir Putin has spent two decades preparing his people for an ideological war with the West. More to the point, though, the Russian people seem to be at their core extremely self-sacrificial and much better suited to bearing the incredible cost of this war's casualties than their Western counterparts. Russia will lose this war. It would have lost even if it had never invaded Ukraine, but after the failed invasion and decimation of its best forces in Ukraine, it has no chance of winning against NATO's might now. But if Western populations pull their support and grow squeamish about the mounting casualties, Russia has a chance to negotiate a favorable peace deal. NATO's forces are the finest in the world, but their populations might be unprepared for the costs of a real war. Now go check out why the US leaving NATO would cause World War III or click this other video instead.